right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're especially excited to start September. We have been doing an entire month of hangouts on marine plastics and ocean plastics, water plastic pollution, uh, and its importance and why we need to solve it. So it's been really, really exciting. I'll get to our speaker in just a second. But right now, we're joined by five classes from across North America. I want to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Miss Lavers, grade, uh, Miss, yeah, Miss Lavers, Miss Lavers, yeah, Miss Lavers class. If they could, oh, Miss, not Miss Lavers class, sorry, not Miss Lavers class. Miss Lavers is who we're speaking to. We've got Miss Woodlands, grade nine class from Belleville, Ontario. I swear I'm not tired. Hi, guys. Oh, hi. <laughs> Okay, we've got Miss Lackey's grade five from Freehold in New Jersey. Hi. I think we've got all of Freehold, New Jersey over the course of these hangouts. We've got Miss Langer's grade three fours in Coburg, Ontario. Yay! Hey. Hey. We've got Miss Painter's grade eights in Salem, Virginia. They've like the comfiest looking chairs in their classroom of all time. Hi guys. And from the looks of things, we have the entire town of Pickerington, Ohio, who gave fives in Miss Orzakowski's class. Hi, guys. Hi. You did it. You were as loud as I hoped. I love it. Okay. So it wasn't Miss Painter's class, Miss Painter's who we're joined with. Uh, so at 11 p.m., all the way from Tasmania, we are joined live by Jennifer Lavers. She is a marine biologist at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies in Tasmania. And she, I'm not going to give it away, but she has the most collaborators of any scientist in the entire world. She gets to work with an awful lot of maybe people, maybe some other kind of creature. I guess we'll find out. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to have you and take it away. Hi, guys. Can you hear me all okay? Yep. Good, good. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for allowing me to come into your classrooms and uh, share with you a bit of my journey that's my plan for today actually is to take you on a little bit of a journey so i'm going to share with you my screen so you can see my slides just give me a second to push a button here and we should be good to go okay so hopefully you can all see my slides now so this is the little journey that we're going to go on for the next few minutes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am. Maybe you already know. Maybe there's something you don't know. Explain a little bit about where in the world is Tasmania, this far-flung place that I'm currently living in. And we're going to spend a bit of time talking about plastic pollution because that's what this couple of weeks is all about, flying by the seat of your pants and, and ocean pollution week. And then I'm going to introduce you to this idea of seabirds as CIA agents, could they really be private investigators or like little secret ninjas? Well, in fact, they can be little super cool dudes and seabirds are really amazing. So let's get started and see all about it. So a little bit about me, I guess. Um, I've been really lucky to work with some amazing people over the years, including you can see in the bottom left-hand panel there, Sir David Attenborough, I think probably all of our idol or icon, he's an amazing man. And I featured alongside him in the film, A Plastic Ocean, which you can see there. Maybe some of you have seen it. You can see it on iTunes and various things. And through my work as a marine biologist, I've been able to travel, including from Canada, where I'm originally from. I grew up in Alberta. So hello to the fellow Canadians. And I now live in Australia. Uh, and then I've traveled on lot, to lots of different islands in between, and I'm going to show you a few of them. And now I spend a lot of my time teaching. So I teach courses like marine conservation and oceanography to try and understand a bit more about our oceans. So I thought I'd take you on a little bit of a journey. Uh, while I'm a marine biologist, and a lot of people think this sounds like a really exciting job, and it is, just like you, I actually spend a lot of time sitting at my desk, reading and learning and studying, and also, of course, teaching my students. I have about 100 students. 
But as a marine biologist, I've been incredibly fortunate to travel to all of these places that you see up on your screen right now, from the Canadian subarctic through to the tropics, Japan, Hawaii, and everything in between. So I'm really going to focus the rest of this talk on just two of these locations, and they're the ones in red. First, I'm going to take us on a little journey to Henderson Island, probably the most remote island on all of planet Earth. And I'm not going to tell you anything more just yet. We'll get to that story. And then we're going to finish up and we're going to talk about Lord Howe Island. But before we do that, where in the world is Tasmania? Where am I right now? Well, that's me, that tiny little triangle at the bottom of Australia in yellow there. That's me. And you can see that you guys are far, far away, about 15,000 kilometers away. To fly here on a plane takes, gosh, nearly 24 hours. And currently in Tasmania, it's about 11 o'clock at night on Friday. So it gives you an idea of how much difference there is between us. So when I talk with people about Tasmania who've never been here before, they usually only know one thing, and that's the Tasmanian devil or the little spinny devil that you see up in the left-hand corner. But actually, Tasmania is this amazing place that has some incredible creatures. So this is what the Tasmanian devil actually looks like if you haven't seen him before. A cute little guy, kind of a cross between a panda and maybe a bear. He's quite small, though. We also, though, have here in Tasmania, if you can believe it, Penguins, little tiny ones, no bigger than the typical seagull that you would see uh, anywhere in your streets. So he's really quite tiny. We also have something called a wombat. I don't know if you've seen or heard of wombats before, but they look like little teddy bears. Um, and they're absolutely gorgeous and a favorite of everyone who visits Tasmania. We also have albatross. In this case, this species is called the shy albatross because the gray on their face makes them look a little bit shy. You can see this gorgeous little chick there. And finally, we have this amazing crayfish or lobster, not just any lobster, but a blue one. And he's not just unique because he's blue, but he doesn't live in the ocean at all, ever. He actually lives in the forest in rivers. It's a freshwater crayfish, so Tasmania is very unique. It also has some beautiful beaches, so please come visit, and some really beautiful alpine rainforests and great hiking if you like to go in the outdoors. So, the first stop on the journey that I want to take you on is Pacific. You can see that red dot. It's really completely out on its own. The nearest continent, the nearest bit of land is 5,000 kilometers away, Chile and South America, really remote. And for centuries, we knew almost nothing about Anderson Island, except maybe one thing. Possibly some of you sitting and listening right now have heard of the book, Moby Dick. Well, Reality, Moby Dick is based on a true story. A whale ship from the United States stopped into the Pacific. It was called the Essex, and it was struck by a sperm whale, and it sunk. And one of the lifeboats from the Essex actually landed on Henderson Island many, many years ago. That's pretty much all we knew about Henderson Island until... Well, really until about two years ago. So a couple of years ago, I was really lucky to spend 101 days, consistent days, no break on Henderson Island. To put that in perspective, the average competitor on the TV show Survivor is only on the TV show Survivor 35 days. So I was on Henderson for three times as long. And Henderson has power, running water, no fresh water, and so there was lots of challenges, like the only way I could have a shower was to basically the ocean. There was no shower. And I only had 10 minutes per week on a satellite phone to call friends and family because 
there is no phone, there is no mobile, there's nothing like that. So how far do you think the nearest airport was to where Henderson Island was? Well, it's a heck of a long way, 850 kilometers. So you can imagine if anything went wrong, we were a long way from help. Near hospital, 2,300 kilometers in Tahiti. Now, what about fresh How crucial is fresh water? Henderson Island does not actually have any fresh water. Near a source of fresh water, 130 kilometers away. So you might be thinking, well, gosh, what did we do for fresh water then? Well, I have an answer to that. We brought with us 3,500 liters of fresh water, or about 100 gallons of fresh drinking water. As you can see, after four days of offloading all of this food and all of the water onto Henderson Island, we were pretty exhausted. That's my call. This incredible place, no power, no running water, no outside communication. No one had been to the island for decades and decades. Nothing was known. And so I was so incredibly fortunate to get to go to this island with a whole group of people, six other people that I'd never met. And we were there for three and a half months. And we had to live in tents and build a big structure in order to collect rainwater because the 3,000 liters that we brought with us was not enough to last for the entire time. And one of the funniest stories that I always tell people about my time on Henderson was the ship that was supposed to take us off of Henderson Island and take me back home broke down about halfway between New Zealand and where I was. It was about 10 days away. And when it finally got to us, it was so late arriving on Henderson Island that I missed my own wedding by three whole days. So the next time you hear of a bride that's missed their wedding by 10 minutes or she's a little bit late, you can tell her my story about how I was that late. But I was on Henderson Island for a very specific reason. And I'd really like to try and maybe show you a couple of the slides. So do we want to take a risk and give- let's, let's risk it. If you're that excited, we'll risk it. Let's do it. I think, yeah. So there's a really good reason that we went to Henderson Island. And what I'm going to show you, hopefully, is two, just two slides. One is a slide from Henderson Island in 1995, which is one of the earliest photos that exists of Henderson Island. And then the next slide I'm going to show you of the exact same spot on Henderson Island, but 20 years later. So let's see how we go. Let's give this a try. Okay. Jeopardy, let's let's see. Now how's how's that looking? Can you can you see that slide? 95, yep. Okay, good, great. So this is East Beach on Henderson Island in 1995. Now the next one is what I was, this is not how I saw it, obviously, but the next slide is the photo that I took standing on the exact same spot. And this is what brought me to Henderson Island. So Henderson Island, despite being thousands of kilometers from the nearest city, is completely covered in rubbish from all corners of the globe. We found rubbish from Germany, China, Canada, Australia, you name it, we found it. And everything from fishing related debris to some really important stuff that you guys are probably gonna recognize. And I think this is really important. Can you see that slide okay? Yep. Great, okay, so this is, this is my slide that I that I use as an opportunity to say, try to see yourself on the beach of Henderson Island. Try to recognize items that you can see in these photos that you or maybe your family or people at work or at school might use. And use this as an opportunity to try and reduce how many of these items you use, or maybe even better, find a complete alternative. So in the top row there, you can see that's all toothbrushes we found thousands and thousands of plastic toothbrushes on Henderson. And here in Australia, we use around 30 million plastic toothbrushes every year alone. And my toothbrush is made out of 
bamboo. So hopefully you're starting to see in each of the cities that you live in, the availability of bamboo toothbrushes becoming more easy for you to find and to get. So that's one thing you can definitely do. Hopefully this slide is showing up okay. You can see that the debris on Henderson was not just, you know, not pretty to look at, but it actually had some real impacts on the animals as well. So the hermit crabs, it looks quite cute seeing them live inside of different containers, but it's actually not, you know, the way that hermit crabs should be living. So that was not great. And we did see turtles and various animals entangled in something we call ghost nets, which is rope or nets that, uh, get out into the ocean and they can still manage to entangle fish and turtles and dolphins and other animals sometimes for decades and this particular turtle unfortunately wasn't so lucky so what i want to do if the slides are still cooperating is take you on the next stop on our journey which is to go to lord howe island so is this still up on the screen okay yeah it's going great so far great. oh excellent okay so I'm really lucky to get to go to Lord Howe Island every single year in April for the past 11 years. You can see that middle panel there. It's a really, really beautiful island. And here in Australia, we call it the Galapagos of Australia, like the Galapagos Islands, because it just is completely covered in seabirds. So the birds that you can see in the bottom panel there, those are seabirds. And what the adult birds do is they fly out over the open ocean, sometimes 500 kilometers, and they travel along until they see something floating on the surface of the ocean that they think is food, maybe it's fish or squid, and they, they pick it up and they collect it. And because they do that, because they cover these huge areas of the ocean and they're willing to sample it or collect little bits and pieces, I call them my CIA agents. It's funny, as a marine biologist, I don't actually spend much time on the ocean. It's not what I expected when I became a marine biologist. And the reason is because the birds do all the hard work for me. They go out on the ocean and they deal with the big waves and the strong winds. And they bring back all the information. So I just have to catch the birds and they tell me everything I need to know. And so what they do is once they've collected a little bit of fish or a little bit of squid, they feed their chicks via something called regurgitation. So they take the food that they've eaten, the adult takes it and they give it to their chick. And it is essentially like vomiting. And so this might sound a little bit gross, but it's actually the way things are. This is a really good time to pause for a moment and think about for a second, you've got a, a seabird species or lots of seabird species that they travel over the ocean, they're flying along and they're gonna recognize anything floating on the surface of the ocean as potential prey. So if we think about what we just saw on Henderson Island, how could this be a problem? Well, unfortunately for seabirds, increasingly when they're flying over the open ocean and they're looking for food, they're not finding food, they're finding plastic because so many parts of the ocean have so much of it. And so this is what I was finding on Lord Howe Island. So this is one of my seabirds. And as you can see, its belly is just completely full of plastic. And this is a baby bird. So the plastic was collected by the adults, by the parents, and fed to this little baby bird until he basically had not enough space left in his belly for food and he did not live. So this is what's happening to a lot of our, our, our seabird species. And I call, uh, what, mean, what happens when this, when this occurs is that because they don't get enough food, they don't have uh, enough body fat, they don't grow quick enough, they don't have enough energy. And so when they try to take flight and fly over these huge distances over the ocean, they just don't make it because they're just not big enough or strong enough. So this is, this is really an unfortunate outcome for so many of the world's seabird species. So the key thing here is what can we or you and all of us do to help? Sometimes solving big problems like climate change or sea level rise, these are big problems and that means they're really challenging. And plastics, marine pollution is another really big problem. 
but sometimes the solutions are actually quite simple. So I like to start with the simple stuff. So there's three things that you can all do starting today and they're completely free. So there's no excuses. So hopefully by now, most of you have heard of uh, micro bead scrubbers. And if not, then this is gonna be really amazing stuff. So our face washes, our body scrubs, lots of different cleansing products, sometimes even the stuff we use to wash our cars contain these tiny little micro beads. Even our toothpaste, even, that we use to scrub our teeth when we brush our teeth at night. All those little colorful particles that you see in these products is usually plastic. And the reason why this is such a bad thing is it's perfectly bite-sized. So it's not just seabirds that can eat the plastic now, but maybe little tiny krill in the ocean or plankton and other animals. So we really need to make sure that this plastic is not getting out there. And the solution is so easy. There's lots of products you can see in the top left corner there that contain apricot shells and coconut beans and sea salt and coffee grounds and all kinds of things that are organic and natural. And so the next time you or your parents are at the grocery store and you're thinking about what face scrub to buy or what body wash to buy, just flip it over and read the label and make sure you buy the one that doesn't contain any plastic. The fish will thank you for it. The next one is Next time you have a birthday party or you go to an event, talk with people when you see balloons and educate them about the potential impacts. So I have, in my work with seabirds, removed so many balloons from the bellies of seabirds. And I'm gonna try a little trick here and hope that my slides cooperate. I'm gonna escape for one second from my slides and I'm gonna come back and show you my face. Let's go back. Nope, oh, hold on. Not cooperating yet. Hold on, there we go. Yep, you're good. Can you see me? Okay, good. So these, which I'm gonna hold up, are all balloon clips. So these are bits and pieces of balloon components. In fact, this balloon clip here still has a little bit of the purple balloon attached to it. All of these clips, I've got quite a few of them here. Gosh, too many to even hold in my hand. You can see them. Different colors, shapes, and sizes all came from the bellies of baby seabirds. So this is a really great opportunity for people to say no to balloons and find alternatives that mean they um, can maybe blow bubbles instead of balloons or use different kinds of banners and buntings, you can use candles or flowers or just about any alternative you can think of that isn't balloons. So here's a, a list there. The other one is uh, if you live near a beach, but even if you don't live near a beach, you can adopt your local area. So I say adopt your local beach, adopt your local street, maybe your schoolyard, and all you need is a few minutes, your own two hands and this particular area and just get involved, collect some data. There's a really great uh, app that you can download on your phone, both for I iPhone and Android, and I can, I can uh, share that information with you if you want. You can then go out and collect data and actually upload that data, and guess where that data will go? It will go to me, so I can actually use that data in my research to look at where plastic is accumulating, how much, maybe what kind of brands are causing problems in your neighborhood so then we can go and talk with the company and try and find alternate packaging to try and make this uh, a better place for all of us. So I wanna say a big thank you to Joe and also to Jesse and throw the floor open to the students. I welcome your, your questions. Outstanding, well thank you so, so much, Jennifer. Glad we got the slides working, that was awesome. Uh, a few quick notes. Bamboo straws, I just looked it up, so they're available everywhere online. They're not much more expensive than regular straws, so do check that out. And then for the Ontario classes, there are great Canadian shoreline cleanups all year long. I know there's some amazing programs in the States as well, but for Ontario, great Canadian shoreline cleanup, and you can do all that stuff uh, very, very easily. So thanks for recommending that. All right, let's do it. start with Miss Woodland's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. <laughs> 
questions. And just said, uh, how long did you go to school for for this job? Oh gosh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna scare you if I answer that. <laughs> um, I did a bachelor's degree at the University of Alberta and also my honors, so that was four years. And then I moved to Memorial University of Newfoundland on the far southeast coast of Canada and did a five-year PhD. So all up nine years. Not too bad. It's not that that scary. It's okay. It's not that scary. It was incredibly enjoyable the whole way through. I learned a lot and I got to travel to a lot of amazing places. So can't by ask for much account, more. By all accounts, those are lovely universities too. So that makes it really good. All right. Uh, let's go to Miss Lackey's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. Um, what inspired you to become a teacher? Um, well, I was just thinking about it. I was like, what inspired you to start working and trying to clean up all the garbage? Fabulous question. So I was really lucky way back in 2005. Were you guys even born in 2005? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got to go to a really remote island in Hawaii and I was there and I was completely surrounded on the island by these gorgeous albatross all around me in the colony and as I would walk around the colony each day my job was to count the albatross and attach little metal rings to their legs so I would know their individual numbers. I couldn't deny the fact that all across the whole surface of the island was toothbrushes and cigarette lighters and bottle caps. And not just on the beach where maybe they had come up by the waves from the ocean, but they were, the, the plastic was all up on the top of the island, far, far, far from the coast. And I started to wonder, how did it get there? And that's when I realized 15 years ago that the seabirds were eating the plastic and they were the ones that were bringing it up onto the island. And being on this remote island in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by gorgeous birds, beautiful beaches, I thought, this we have to do something about this. And back then, nobody was really talking about plastics. And I decided that I was going to make it my mission to make plastic on the tip of everyone's tongues. And so I'm so glad that I'm here talking with each of you today because it means that part of my strategy has worked. Hooray! <laughs> That's an awesome story. And for what it's worth, it's really worked. So I think we've had 30, we're having 30 hangouts this month and like they filled up like that. So that's six to seven classes per hangout. So people really do. Brilliant. Want to know. So great job. Uh, just quick note before we go to our third class, we've got five groups watching online. If you guys want to submit questions in the YouTube chat bar on the right, I can pass them along. So please do do that. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll go to Miss Langer's class with the girl who's been waiting for a long time. Go right ahead. Um, when did you get interested in that picking up garbage? Or just studying marine biology, she wants to know. Well, I always knew I was going to work in ecology and probably even with birds. When I was little, just like you, when I was a small girl, I took care of birds uh, and uh, would take in injured birds and then take care of them and then release them. So I knew from day one that that's what I was going to do. But marine biology, I got just completely hooked on it when I started going to all these islands. And it's such an adventure going there and seeing palm trees. And sometimes one island I went to, there were polar bears. And from that point onwards, marine biology was all I ever wanted to do. So I've been doing marine biology for about 20 years now, quite a long time. All right, we'll go to the entire town again in Ohio, Ms. Orzakowski's class. Uh, if you guys have a question, go right ahead. Or 20 questions. There's so many of you. <laughs> Go ahead, Lydia. Which animal is your favorite animal to help? Oh, that's such a tough question because there's, I'm torn, I'm torn. Um, when I worked in the Canadian Arctic, I worked with a bird called the razor bill. Like it's, it's bill is sharp like a razor blade. So maybe you can Google it later and find some pictures. They look like penguins. They're black on the back but white on the belly, but they're tiny. They're only maybe about that big. And I just fell completely in love with them because 
nobody had ever heard of them before. They're kind of like that, the underdog that you need to fight for and say, this is really cool. And when they sit in the sun, they tilt their head back like they're really relaxed and they open their mouth and the inside of their mouth is lemon yellow, really, really bright. They're just gorgeous. So go and look up a photo and I hope that you love razor bills as much as I do. I'm sure they will. They are a beautiful bird. Uh, you know what? Let's go back to Ms. Orzakowski's class again. There are so many of you with like multiple classes, so please do ask a second question. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. We live in the middle of our country, not near a shore. Do we need to worry about our trash getting into the ocean? Ooh, good question. Oh, such a good question. Well done. Absolutely. So all rivers run to the ocean in one way or another. So we need to do everything that we can to prevent uh, any of our waste entering the oceans. And that includes those little microbead scrubbers that I was showing in one of my slides. So every time you wash your face or you have a shower, some of that can make it out into the rivers and ultimately out into the ocean. So that's a really big problem. Also, as scientists, what we're finding out is that we don't just need to be worried about plastic in the ocean. Some of the highest concentrations of plastic are actually in our lakes and our rivers. So the Great Lakes in, in the US and Canada are really struggling right now with plastic. So we need to be very mindful of our lakes and our rivers as well and, and do everything we can there. I think it's even said in Finding Nemo that like all water leads to the ocean, which is a good way of thinking about it. So great question. Perfect. I wish all kids would just pop up like that into the screen before they ask questions. That was amazing. So thank you. Um, we've got a question online from Mr. Kozachinsky's class, grade second grade class in Canton, Michigan, which is, is there a way to quickly or easily clean the large floating plastic islands in the ocean? And before you answer that, if you could explain a little bit about those floating plastic islands, that would be great. Sure, sure. So these floating islands of trash that they've become known as, um, they're actually not really like islands. It's more like a plastic soup. So the plastic that's out in the ocean, most of it is teeny tiny, what we call microplastics. And so uh, when you're out on the boat with your family or maybe you're sailing somewhere, you probably actually won't see a lot of it because to see it, you'd have to hang your head over the side of the boat and get really, really close to the surface of the water. But sometimes just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. If you think about CO2 in the atmosphere or the oxygen we breathe, we can't see it, but it's definitely there. But what happens in the ocean is we have wind and wave, which waves, which, which, you know, the wind blows very consistently and it creates something called a gyre kind of like when you drain the water from your sink or you flush your toilet and it makes it kind of go around in a circle. It's not something you can see from space if you're an astronaut. It's something that's enormous, thousands of kilometers across. But what it essentially does is the wind and the wave causes plastic to concentrate in the center. So you have these areas of lots and lots of plastic. And that's a really big problem when you also have lots and lots of animals living there. And so what some people have hoped is that you could find a way to clean up those hotspot areas where all that plastic is. And some proposals have been put forward, but unfortunately right now the technology is just not quite there. Maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years. There's so many limitations. You can imagine working in the ocean when you can have 20 meter waves and 40 knot winds, and those are some pretty hard conditions to work in. So we haven't quite got there yet. Okay, great answer. All right, uh, Jennifer, do you have time for another round of four questions? Sure. Great, all right, well, let's go back to Ms. Woodland's class then. Um, what's your favorite part about your job? Um, I think I would have to say probably two things. One is it's an absolute honor and privilege to get to travel to all of these remote and protected places and work with some incredibly iconic species. When I was on Henderson Island, there's a tiny little bird called a crake, a Henderson Island crake, if you ever want to look it up. It's small and black with brilliantly orange legs. 
and they have so much personality. They're like a, a miniature chicken. And I can remember walking through this tangled forest on Henderson Island. It's very, very thick forest. And these tiny little orange and black birds scurrying about my feet. And it was a very special moment for me, unforgettable, because I'm on one of the rarest islands, remotest islands in the world, surrounded by one of the rarest birds in the world that has all this cheeky personality. It's kind of coming up to me and wanting to check out who I am. And I thought to myself in those moments, I possibly am the first human being this bird has ever and may ever see. And moments like that just completely take your breath away. And then I think the second part of that answer is being able to share those kinds of photos and those kinds of stories with the world. Because one of my favorite sayings is, we can't care about what we don't know about. So if we want you guys, the next generation, or your parents or politicians to fight for the oceans, to fight for these species, you have to first know it exists. I have to tell you that Henderson Island is out there and that it's special and beautiful and has incredible birds. If I don't do that, then I think maybe maybe I haven't done my job right. We get that question almost every hangout, and that's one of the best answers I've ever heard, and I've done over 100. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> let's, let's go to Miss uh, Miss Lockie's class. Um, have you ever heard of boiling slate in the ocean cleanup? I certainly have. So he's just launching his prototype off the coast of San Francisco right now as we speak. So he's one of the researchers that is trying to clean up the plastic that is in the ocean. And there's a lot of people, probably a lot of you out there, who uh, really think that his creativity and his, his um, energy for this is really, really exciting. And I would completely agree with you. Um, but uh, as a scientist, what I'm waiting for is to wait and see if this is actually going to work. Because as a scientist, that's exactly what we do. We trial things, we test them, and then if they do work, great. If they don't work, we go back to the drawing board. So right now, we're at the stage where nobody in the world can really tell us if this will work. Even Boyan, we wish him luck and we wait to see whether or not it's actually gonna work. And hopefully we get some good news. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll have to cover that when it's uh, when the trial's over. Uh, I yes. have a quick question to pass on for myself. So when you disappeared for those couple minutes, I told the classes about uh, David Attenborough on Lord Howe Island calling up into the trees and birds falling down out of the trees. I don't know if you've ever seen this video, but it's remarkable. Oh, yes. And I, I have to ask if like, have you tried this? Because I've always wanted to. Oh, many times. Yes, many times. Never as gracefully as, as Sir David. Um, yes, so David Attenborough went to Lord Howe Island in 1995 uh, for The Life of Birds. So if you want to watch that clip, you can Google it or you can go and get a copy of The Life of Birds. And he climbed, I think he was about 80 years old then or 75 years old. He climbed all the way to the top of this huge mountain on Lord Howe Island just to see these birds, which is amazing. And he went... Do, 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 do. And Lord Howe Island and this particular species of seabird, this is the only place in the world that it happens that seabirds literally fall from the sky. And sure enough, he made his little noise and the birds came crashing down. And even though 20 years has passed, we still don't fully understand why the birds do this. But we think it's because they think we're intruders in the forest and their nests, their burrows are all in the forest. And so when we make noise, they want to come down and see what's happening and maybe defend their nest. But it's just a theory. Nobody knows for sure. Have you done it personally? Oh, all the time. Yes, oh. it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to pass on a real serious question um, from Mr. Daner's grade 7, 8 class in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, they said... You work with different seabirds. Does that include penguins? Would they be harder to work with than other birds? Yes. Yes. I, I have only worked with one species of penguin, and that's the little penguin that's here in Tassie. It's only really, like I said, about the size of a, a large gull. But 
my goodness, if they're anything like other penguins, they are really feisty. So when you pick them up, their little wings go, they just don't stop. They, the whole time you're trying to hold them, they just don't stop. And, and um, they are much, much tougher than you would think. They, they really give you a good run for your money. Okay. Excellent. Let's go to Miss Langer's class. Hi there. Um, hello, my name is Julian. And um, do the animals in the wa water and the land eat plastic or other things like wood and stuff like that? Hi, Julian. They eat both and both on land and at sea. So uh, I find in my birds, I find little bits of wood. So you were perfectly right. We do find wood. Also, maybe a bit of metal. So the other day I found a beer bottle cap in the belly of a seabird and lots and lots of plastic and sometimes also glass. So it's not just plastic that we need to be really careful of as, as humans. We also need to be careful about everything else that we use. Okay. Does that answer your question? Is that good? Yeah. Good. Yeah? Okay. Bye. Let's go to Miss Orzakowski's class. Uh, would you guys again, if you want to ask two questions, we'll start with one and go right ahead. Yep. How do you feel about straws? Oh, gosh. I think they're my least favorite thing. I hope they're also your least favorite thing. So I'm really encouraged, though, that uh, a lot of people, a lot of communities, entire towns and cities all around the world are really starting to get on board with either banning straws along with bags and all kinds of things, or at least voluntarily removing them and refusing them. Is, is your town one of those? Are you guys banning straws or reducing straws? Fabulous. So that is also a type of plastic that I find all the time on beaches, regardless of where I go in the world, is plastic straws. And it's just so unnecessary. You can either drink your drink without them, of course. We, all, we can all do that. Or if you really need a straw, like for a Slurpee or a milkshake, you can get a paper straw. Uh, there are also metal ones now, too. So a lot of people are using those. It's been a really great shift. And when you go to a restaurant, you can just ask that you don't want a straw. Anytime you go in, they'll bring it to you automatically. You can ask for to not have one, which is great. All right. Miss Orzkowski's class, take two. Second question. Go for it, guys. All right. I have a student that wanted me to ask this question. <laughs> He's concerned about our economy. If we eliminate all this plastic, are we going to affect the economy in a major in a major way? I I personally don't think so. Um, I think we we can make the transition. So certain uh, industries, certain manufacturers, maybe won't be able to manufacture the type of product, for example, plastic that they make now. But what we're increasingly seeing really, really rapidly is all of the alternative products are just becoming hugely abundant. The demand for them is exploding. So here in Australia, in the span of, gosh, less than 12 months, we went from never really talking about straws at all, plastic straws, to incredible numbers of cafes and restaurants and shops refusing to provide straws and looking for alternatives. And as a result, there's now advertisements on the TV and on social media for all of these companies that have, have all of a sudden been created to fill that demand. So I think there will be a period of companies having to adapt, but I think everyone will, will be able to find a role for themselves, a job for themselves. You just won't make plastic anymore. Maybe you'll make, instead of plastic straws, you'll make paper ones really interesting we we don't actually often get that question of sort of environmental ideas pitted against the economy and it's something that gets talked about a lot so thank you so so much for that question uh just as a good example of a hangout we had even a few days ago we had a company called Boreo, and what they do is they they take plastic fishing nets they encourage fishermen to get them out of the ocean they pay the fishermen and then they melt down those fishing nets and make products with them so perfect example of an economical benefit to removing plastic pollution doing something a little different uh but great question Jennifer, I, I just have to ask, is there anything else you'd like to tell our classes before we wrap up for the day, before midnight comes and we actually like shift into Saturday for you? Uh, uh, <laughs> any last message? 
Oh, I'm so grateful for you sharing my Friday night, your Friday morning with me. Um, thank you for all your wonderful questions. And um, this has been a fantastic opportunity. I'm so glad to have met you all. Thank you so, so much. So Jennifer, what we do at the end of every Hangout is I'm going to deem you every class's microphone. So Miss Woodland, Miss Lackey, Miss Langer, Miss Orzakowski, if you guys could join me in saying a big thank you to Jennifer for joining us today. So thank you, Jennifer. You guys maintained that note for so long. Uh, Jennifer, so lovely having you for the classes. Thanks for being a part of our Ocean Plastics Month. We've got many more hangouts, so please do check them out. If you guys want to watch any part of this, follow up with your questions. It's all going straight to YouTube. And uh, thanks so much again. Jennifer, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much for all you do. Thank you, guys. Come see me.